I am so sorry. Look, Ari Aster is someone that needs no introduction in modern cinema. With films like Hereditary and Midsommar under his belt, and the fact that he's at the top of the horror genre right now, he's one of the most critically acclaimed creators under the A24 umbrella. Oh, one of the most, most uh, extraordinary new, new voices in, in world cinema, right here. Um. Yep. <laughs> so, four years since his last film, in a higher bar than ever, comes his collaboration with Oscar-winning actor Joaquin Phoenix, Bo is Afraid. And it's really, really weird. Look, Ari Aster is no slouch when it comes to the use of weirdness when it comes to his films. I'd probably even go further as to say he's the type of director to pull something like this off other than, say, a David Lynch Good morning. or Charlie Kaufman. Two people here really took a couple of pages out of their books for this film, really relying on that dreamy and off-putting take on their films. Not only that, but it also reminded me of Scorsese's After Hours, but with a surrealist approach, as well as Kafka's The Trial, which I've never read the book for, but I've seen the film by Orson Welles, which I really, really loved. So, Astor having all these creative and critically acclaimed works to draw inspiration from, I'd say Bo is Afraid is a definite success in flexing your talent as a director. Because this being a three-hour film, for me, it classifies itself as an epic. And we all know how these kinds of films are received critically, especially recently where you either love them or hate them. And Astor was not only able to bring his script to life to match his off-putting vision, but also keep me very much interested in the hero's journey throughout. Pacing is a major factor in a film like this, where you really have to not put your audience overboard too early or too late with all the weird and crazy things you're showing them, which was very much pushing those limits a lot of times. But I feel like almost going to and stopping at that edge of weird, where you're just put off by everything that's happening or going to happen, shows how competent you are a bit. In limiting yourself with the overabundance of blood, screaming, and stabbing, and everything that happens pretty much in the first part of the film. Except for one part, which I'll get to in a bit. But overall, the pacing feels structured and orderly no matter what's going on, where transitioning from set piece to set piece comes with a gigantic halt on the plot to bring it down like 20 notches. It didn't bother me at all, but I could see where it could be a problem for others. What helps is that it's consistent with Bo's journey and that it's constantly persistent in almost every conversation he has with anyone until the end of the film, while also throwing in some red herrings, explicit foreshadowing, and still questioning what and why this is happening to him. And Joaquin Phoenix does a great job at this lost puppy approach where he's in control of all the things that's happening to him, but he's also not at the same time. Like he's legit clueless at times that he should be, and still clueless at times where he shouldn't be and it works when the whole world feels like it's against him. It worked in a trial, it worked in after hours, and it works here as well. I also liked how cartoony and over the top the supporting cast is, especially Nathan Lane and Amy Ryan as this overly friendly upper middle class family to match Phoenix's unstable self. Am I dead? No, no, you've been healing so quickly. And no organs were hit and you're, you're bleeding. Speaking of that dreamy aspect I mentioned earlier, the film's production designers and art department are putting this film on their back. The combination of those two groups creates a sort of fluid and abstract visual feel it has throughout the whole film, and it really works. But now, let's get on to some spoilers. With it being three hours long, I said this earlier, but I like that it separated itself into different parts to control the pacing. Clearly defined sections to introduce new phases of Bo's never-ending nightmare. From the apartment, to the house, to the forest, and finally to his mom's house. But with that, it's still three hours long, and it's a very draining three hours because of everything that Aster is throwing at you. And it really goes overdrive when Bo goes to the attic at the end. It was teased throughout the whole movie in the form of flashbacks and dream sequences. And to me, this movie really had to strike hard with its ending and its themes. But similar to Hereditary with a very similar attic scene, it did not work for me. I get it, the monster's supposed to be a representation of what his mom thinks of his dad and the hole that narcissism has throughout the film, but come on, you can't have your monster looking like that and expect me not to go off course for the serious parts of the film. And I even get having the trial at the end where his mom perceives his actions throughout the film differently than what it was actually portrayed. But that one attic scene tanked the ending for me. Even with that, I still think it's a pretty good film, and one of the best immersive theater experiences I've had in a while. It's like an artistic car crash in a lot of the best ways possible. I'm filling a 3.5 out of 5 on this. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and thanks for watching.